Hopefully you're all joining the WebEx for the five common pitfalls of noise measurements. And, uh, and so you're here. I wanted to give a little bit of a brief introduction here. My name is Ken Cox. Uh, you can see a picture of me there so you'll know who's talking to you. A little bit of information about me. My current job is I'm the product manager at Larson Davis. I'm, I'm actually a very unique person that I've worked at Larson Davis now for over 30 plus years. Uh, I've worked in engineering, engineering management, and uh, now product management. And I also uh, represent uh, Larson Davis and the U.S. in some standards committees, both for the ANSI S1 and the IEC TC29, which are the standards uh, associated with sound level meters and microphones and calibrators and those kinds of things. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present to you a little bit of the information that uh, I and Larson Davis have learned over the years about uh, some things to do to, to avoid and also to do to make good measurements. So those of us who've made outdoor measurements, we know that making an, a measurement outdoors can, can sometimes be quite difficult. And a lot of times we don't get a second chance. So. We really want to do it right the first time. So what I want to do is just cover a few of the uh, common things we see that are maybe mistakes that people make when making a measurement, and also talk about the most important part, what you can do, do to avoid making that mistake, because ultimately we don't want to make the mistake, right? So here's our quick list of things that we want to cover. We'll cover the uh, using weather protection for our instruments, We'll cover briefly doing site selection. We'll talk about getting the right data, making sure we plan correctly for power and plan correctly for our data file sizes. So we want to keep this uh, presentation short and brief because we recognize your time is valuable. So I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. First of all, weather protection. And I uh, want to talk, uh, talk about microphone specifically to help you understand why this is important. So we have here kind of a cutout view of a microphone. And the way these work is there's this little top film on the top we call the diaphragm. And it moves in and out in response to sound pressure waves and creates a charge on this back part called the back plate. And that's proportional to the sound pressure. So I think we could all pretty much envision that if I get rain or water droplets on top of this, it's going to add weight on the top of that or water between this grid cap, and that's going to affect how it, how it functions. And an easy way for you to envision that is just think of this like a drum head. You know, if, if I have a drum and I put something on it and weigh it down, it changes how it sounds. Uh, same with a microphone. If I put something on that diaphragm, it changes how it responds. But that's not actually one of the uh, most insidious things that can happen. Um, microphones are kind of unique in that because they respond to air pressure inside here, this area inside is a little cavity of air. And it's important that the static air pressure inside this cavity matches the static air pressure outside. Otherwise, it would push that diaphragm in or out and change how it responds. So to accomplish that, uh, all microphones have a little uh, hole somewhere that allows air to move in and, in and out of this uh, cavity in the back. Well, that all sounds good and nice, except there's one little bad consequence to that. And because it's open to air, it means it's also open to humidity. And so any water vapor that's uh, in the air can get into the back there. What that means is when it gets cold, the first thing to cool is the little thin diaphragm, and it can actually create condensation on the back side of that diaphragm inside of the microphone where you cannot see it. But what it does is it forms a little water droplet in that na narrow gap and changes how the microphone responds. Now, this is, this is more challenging because it'll change significantly what the microphone measures, but as a user, you'll never know what's happening because you'll just think, oh, gee, it was something different. So that's one of the problems that we want to try to protect against. Another one with the weather that we want to try to protect against is just wind. So we all are aware of wind as it rustles through the leaves or whatever the leaves make noise and et cetera. And that's not what we're trying to protect against. What we're trying to protect against is as 
as wind moves across the microphone. At the corners of the microphone, and I'll come back up here, like these corners right here, these edges, it creates little vortices or swirls, and those swirls uh, are very close to the diaphragm, so they get measured as noise that really isn't noise that's present in the environment. So we want to try to minimize that noise. And uh, <clears throat> what I've shown you here is kind of a graph with uh, what we do to protect against that normal is we put what we call a windscreen. It's a foam, a piece of foam. And the idea of that piece of foam is to simply slow down the air around the microphone so it doesn't get so much, uh, so many vortices, and but also allow the sound to come to the microphone unimpeded. And this is kind of a graph that shows versus wind speed. So here's wind speed in miles per hour. Here's wind speed in meters per second, if you prefer that and the amount of A-weighted noise that's generated uh, with this device. I've highlighted here in green kind of the, the boundary between 20 miles per hour or 10 meters per second. A lot of times people use that as a as kind of a flag. If the wind level is higher than that, uh, they'll question their noise level readings because they could have significant wind contamination. So that's another thing we want to protect against. So what do we do? Typically, uh, we put microphones in some type of a protection system. And I've shown here a picture of one that we have. We call it our EPS 2116. And it's this, uh, this black part right here is all the EPS. And uh, this little part right here is just a cutout of what's inside. And uh, this is a bird spike. Keep birds off. Here's that windscreen I was describing. It's a piece of foam. And this little piece that looks kind of like a tent here, or a teepee, uh, that's actually a piece of, uh, we call it hydrophobic. Uh, basically, it just means it doesn't soak up water, right? It's like your Gore-Tex stuff, kind of. And that sits over the microphone, and the microphone sits right up in here. So it keeps water off. It keeps uh, the wind off. It keeps birds off. And then depending upon your type of microphone, you can either put desiccants in here, which dry the air coming into the microphone so you don't get the condensation in the back. Or there are also products that have heaters and things built into them to, to protect against the moisture. So, so this is highly recommended. Over here you can see I have a few don't use. Uh, I put these here because these are things that, uh, unfortunately, we see too often. Uh, one is don't just put a balloon over your microphone and preamplifier. It actually does affect the acoustics, and it can trap moisture inside the microphone, actually making it worse. And uh, don't do nothing either. Now, there's one exception to that. If you're doing a short-term measurement for an hour or two and you do nothing, you're okay. This is really... Uh, this is really applicable if you're leaving the system out, uh, especially overnight, you know, because morning time is when you get due and things like that, and you're not sure. You need to have it protected. So that's one thing. Uh, make sure we protect our systems against weather. And not only the microphone, but we need to protect our meters also. Uh, they're subject to condensation and, uh, and rain and stuff like that. So, again, I put a few pictures up here. You can see if some of... Uh, some of our products, uh, this is pretty typical, right? You put the meter in a pelican case or some watertight case and seal the cable. And you can see here the microphone's protected here, the meter's protected here. This is a system that could be left outdoors for a long period of time and uh, be protected against the wind and the rain and the condensation and things like that. So as you're making a measurement, consider how the weather affects it and make sure you're using proper protections. That's uh, probably pitfall one to avoid. The next one I want to talk about is just site selection. So first thing to note is we're measuring sound waves, and they are a wave, and so they will reflect from surfaces. And if, uh, if any of you, you can decide if you were fortunate or unfortunate enough to take a physics class. You know that when waves are, are reflected, you can have what's known as either constructive or destructive interference. And that is, that is, as they come back on themselves, it can either make the signal louder or it can make it quieter. Uh, we want to avoid that when measuring sound because sound is a wave. And so the best thing to do is just to stay away from reflective surfaces. A general rule of thumb I hear quite frequently is to stay at least a meter away. And uh, more is always better. 
you want to probably be at least one wavelength from the lowest frequency of interest. So that's one thing to be aware of. Also, as you're deploying instruments, be aware of other noise sources around where you're at. If, For example, if I wanted to measure the noise in a park, I probably wouldn't be wise to put my noise meter right next to the road next to the park, right? I'd probably end up measuring more road noise than I would park noise. And so I put a few things there we can consider and look at. Uh, always we want to consider the physical security. We know that uh, noise monitoring equipment itself is not inexpensive, and we know that the time to make the measurement is also not inexpensive. So I put down here just a few things that people do to help maximize their physical security. Obviously, put it away from public places, out of sight, uh, improves the security. Uh, people, if you can, put it behind a fenced barrier. Uh, I know a lot of people will just use height. They'll put the meter, you know, 10 feet up on a pole or in a tree or something like that to just make it more difficult to access. And also, people who hide them or will, you know, spray graffiti on the cases and things to make them look less valuable. Typically, if you're measuring noise emitted from a from a source like a factory or something like that or a racetrack, you want to measure at the property boundaries so you know what's being emitted. Uh, you don't want to measure you know, in the middle where it's loudest or anything like that. The other thing here to consider, and we see this from our service department, is, is make sure you consider the influences that may not be present at the time. Uh, we've had people hide their meters in a ditch only to find out that somebody turned on the water and flooded it. Or as you can see here, we love this picture here, this, this customer set up a game camera next to their system and the moose were quite interested in their noise monitoring equipment. So you can see some examples there. So just think about the unwanted noise sources, keep away from reflective surfaces, and uh, consider the physical security. Another part of the instrument deployment is just instrument marking. Uh, here's an example of a customer's equipment where they put tags on it. And uh, I showed you an example on the previous slide of somebody who used a game camera to, to mark it. Part of the reason that this is important is in today's world, uh, we're now much more conscious about our own security and threats of terrorism and things like that. And I've received several reports of people who will deploy a noise monitor. Somebody will see them taking this case out and putting it maybe next to a railroad track or something like that. And they call the police. The police come to investigate. If it's not marked, they think it's a bomb and they blow it up. And uh, so you want to have some type of marking so that if somebody wonders what it is, they have a number they can call, someone they can talk to. A lot of people will just inform the local police or local authorities what they're doing so that if somebody calls in, then, uh, then, they, then they understand what it is. So those are a couple of things on deployment and instrument marking that we've learned through experience will help make a better measurement and a better experience. Here's, here's another important one that I just list as incorrect data. And kind of the headline up there is important. Just because you get a number doesn't mean it's correct. And, uh, and so the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do I know if I'm getting a good number for my sound level meter reading? And there's a, I've listed a few things we can do here. Uh, number one, of course, is just use a quality instrument. Uh, look for Look for manufacturers that uh, will provide a complete factory test. Um, they'll provide what's known as pattern approval. Pattern approval is when you submit your product as a manufacturer, we would submit our product to an independent third-party lab, and they essentially test everything that's required by you know, class one or class two requirements. And they'll issue a certificate saying, yes, it passed, if it, if it does pass. Uh, Reputable sound level meter manufacturers will do these things. Uh, in general, I just put down here, you tend to get what you pay for. And another key thing here is to do an acoustic calibration before and after your measurement. So I've got a picture here. This is an acoustic calibrator. This is our Model 831 sound level meter. Uh, this will put a tone of a known sound pressure level at the microphone so you can verify that you're reading the right levels. Another another thing to just that I 
probably can't stress enough is just verify your instrument setup. It's, we get far too many calls from people who went out and made a measurement and realized they didn't measure the right thing and wondering what they can do. Sometimes we can help them, but sometimes, unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done except retake the measurement. We talked about protecting from the environment, and uh, the next one here is a little more esoteric. It's ensure the meter will measure the desired level of sound. And what I mean here is if, say, you're measuring someplace where it's really quiet and then you might need to measure levels down to 20 dBA or something, ensure that your meter will measure down to 20 dBA and that you have the right range set for that. If uh, on the opposite end you're going to measure some loud sig levels, uh, make sure that your meter will, is set up and appropriate for measuring those loud signals. Uh, if the sound level is too loud for a me meter to measure, we get what's known as an overload. And uh, sometimes customers will ask, well, gee, I got an overload. Does that affect my data? And unfortunately, our answer is, I don't know because we don't know how loud it was. It was too loud to be measured. And the same thing kind of exists on the, on the opposite end. We call it an underrange. Uh, one thing to consider here besides these other steps is consider remote monitoring and using the internet so you can check on your meter and you can check on your data and uh, make sure that everything is correct and operating as expected. Next one is incomplete data. So this is kind of the ugly step sister, ugly step sister of the wrong data, right? So the uh, Again, we'll, we'll note that measurements are expensive. We only want to do it once. So the key thing here I would recommend is make sure that you understand and know the metrics and that you're measuring the right thing. And modern meters today will measure a lot of different metrics. So if you're unsure, I recommend measuring it. Uh, too much data is better than not enough. And in this example here, what I've shown is just a history of some noise levels. This is actually just outside of our factory here. You can see when it gets loud. Uh, in this case, we have where these purple bars are, there's little audio recording. So we can use that to identify the noise and make sure that we're measuring what we want, especially when it gets loud. The key thing here is know, know your metrics. Make sure you've turned on and measuring what it is that you really need. Next is just a little bit about power planning. Uh, it's, there's nothing worse than uh, going through, you get all your metrics right, your setup right, everything's ready to go, you deploy the meter, and you go out to get it, and you realize there's no power. And uh, some common pitfalls there that can cause that to occur. Number one is just using extension cords. Uh, realize they can be easily unplugged by anyone, and if you're relying on that for the power, you may not get a measurement. Also note that batteries are rated for their capacity when they are new and at room temperature. As they age and the weather gets colder, the capacity goes down. And so my recommendation is plan appropriately so that you get enough, if you're powering by battery, that you have enough battery for the whole measurement. Uh, kind of last one here is plan for your data file sizes. I put over here a little bit of a table just if, you know, if you're recording audio data, this is the thing that tends to make big data files, is, is just recording continuous audio. So for example here, if I were to record for one day, 24 hours at 16 kilohertz, I would create a file that's 1.4 gigabytes for every day that I record. And so we need to make sure that we plan for those and uh, have enough storage and also store files frequently that they don't get too large on a meter. So kind of a, a quick summary here then. What should we do? We've talked about a lot of mistakes that we can make, but let's talk about what we can do. Let's use weather protection, make sure we don't get uh, bad readings because of rain or wind or something like that. Carefully select our sites, mark our instruments, make sure that we understand what it is we're measuring and that it's turned on. Make sure that we're using a quality product that's designed to do what we want to do. Uh, always calibrate before and after the measurement. This is your check of the whole system that it's measuring correctly and your evidence of that. Plan for your power and anticipate your data storage and communication options. Again, I thank you very much for attending this presentation and uh, thank you very much.